This is one of three review videos after you've read the chapter, after you've gone through the lecture videos. These are short videos that are going to be looking at the basis of the basis of movement, both the planes of motion, axis of rotation, and the muscle contraction type, eccentric or concentric. So in this video, video number one, we're going to really focus on the planes of motion, the axis of rotation, and the concept of how do we go about um, starting our movement analysis. So you have your three primary planes of movement. You have your cardinal planes, which you have your sagittal plane, normally referred to as a sagittal plane. You have your transverse plane, which is also referred to as the horizontal plane. And then you have your coronal plane, which is referred to as the frontal plane. So those three planes, sagittal, frontal, and uh, horizontal, that's that captures the three-dimensional system, how we analyze, view, and assess movement. Now there is a fourth plane, and it's referred to as the diagonal or the oblique plane, and it's basically movement that's occurring that does not occur in one of these sagittal planes, and so there's infinite uh, in computations of that particular plane. So if it's not the coronal, not the transverse, not the sagittal, what's left, if, especially if it's going at like an angle, it's the diagonal or the oblique plane. Now the movement occurs via rotation, and in order to have rotation, you have an axis of rotate. You have an axis of movement or axis of rotation. So if I look here and I'm looking at the frontal plane, and I put a pin or a screw right into this particular point here, this is going to be my sagittal axis that allows movement to occur in that frontal or coronal plane. If I put a pin through the vertical axis, straight up and down the longitudinal axis. That's going to be the pin that allows movement to occur within the transverse plane. And if I put a pin into the side, so the frontal axis or the medial lateral axis, that's going to be movement that allows in the sagittal plane. And it's these three axes that allow movement in these three planes. So you always think of them as a combo aspect, that uh, the axis of rotation is perpendicular or 90 degrees to that particular plane, and the movement is, is occurring through that. Now, this is looking at it from the center of mass, looking at the human body as a whole from anatomical position. That's our reference position. But this assessment really can occur at any single joint, and it actually occurs at every single joint. So like at the shoulder, where I have three degrees of freedom, and what that means is that I have three different axes that allow me to move in three different planes. If I move down to, let's say, the hip, which also has three degrees of freedom, I'm looking at flexion, extension in the sagittal plane, ab and abduction, or horizontal ab and abduction, internal or external rotation, the transverse plane. If I go down to the knee, now the knee only has two degrees of freedom because it only has two axes. It has a longitudinal axis and it has the medial lateral axis, so it has two degrees of freedom. And if I go to, let's say, the ankle, which technically is only one degree per joint, but we look at collectively as three degrees of freedom. If I were to go to, like, the, say, the elbow, that would be one degree of freedom because it only allows movement in those particular planes. So although you learn the cardinal planes from the, you know, perfectly dividing the body into left and right halves or top and front, top and bottom halves or front and back, in reality, these planes exist at any different segment. Most of the time when we do this analysis, we're going to be looking at this three dimensional coordinate system, which each of these axes and each of those planes represented in this image should be familiar to one of the videos where we do this joint by joint analysis, three degrees of freedom, one degree of freedom, two degrees of freedom, so forth. And you're going to actually analyze the coordinate system for each of those. And really what this is allowing us to do is to, to give the terms uh, that we use for movement assessment. So in this case, we're looking at elbow movement. That's where the axis would be. And the plane is the sagittal plane. And if I'm closing the distance, that's flexion. And if I'm increasing the distance, that's extension. So if I look at, let's say, one joint, in this particular example, I'm looking at the shoulder. Remember, three degrees of freedom, so it has movement in all three planes. I can look at now and start to analyze all the available movements that are occurring there at the shoulder. So in the sagittal plane, through that medial lateral or frontal axis, I have flexion and extension. Through the frontal plane, through that anterior posterior sagittal axis, I have adduction, abduction and adduction. And then at the bottom here, I have my transverse plane motion. And we have only at the hip and the shoulder do we have this special designation of ab and abduction. It's basically abduction and adduction that's happening at 90 degrees of flexion. And it's happening in that horizontal or transverse plane. So the axis of rotation is that vertical axis. And I'm getting horizontal abduction or horizontal adduction. Or if I keep my arm closer to my side and the axis is going through the, the long part of the bone, that's going to be external internal rotation. So this is looking at one joint and then looking at all three planes.
we can also look at is look at the entire plane and look at all the joint actions that occur from there. So if I look at all sagittal plane motion about that medial lateral axis, I'm going to get trunk flexion and extension or anywhere through that spinal segment, shoulder, elbow, wrist, hip, knee, and of course, ankle and foot. So you can look at it either what is available at those degrees of freedom at the joint or look at the entire plane and see the movement that's occurring there. I think the biggest concept that we want to look at is this axis of rotation. So if we see the spinning wheel that's occurring, we want to appreciate that when I put that pin through, it's the bone that is rotating or spinning through that axis of rotation. So you can kind of see that spin. And that's what we want to think of is that we have this pivot point, the joint, and we have that bone spinning. Now, the human body doesn't allow 360 degrees of rotation. So we look at it from like maybe 45 degrees or 120 degrees or 180 degrees, and that's all going to be dependent upon the structure and function of that particular joint. But the concept is the same. I'm going to rotate in deflection or rotate into extension. So if I have my, my axis here, my pin, and we appreciate the spinning wheel, and that's my axis that's going through the sagittal plane that's allowing motion to occur, if I put my pin right there at this point, the, seg the body's going to be able to rotate segmentally in deflection and rotate back into extension. Now, it's only maybe 30 degrees there and 30 degrees there. Obviously, it's more, but um, it's not 360 degrees in that spinning aspect. And I can apply this to all parts of the body, whether I'm looking at the neck, looking at the shoulder, knee, whatever it may be. It's that pivot point and that spinning. Even down at the ankle. Uh, now, when we look at the upper body and the lower body, when we look at the appendicular skeleton, so the, the skeleton that is the arms and legs, or the axial skeleton, so those are two divisions, um, the terminology is the same. So whether I'm moving the trunk and spine, flexion and extension, or moving the, the appendages, the appendicular skeleton, it's flexion and extension. The only oddball there is going to be the ankle. And it, this is still considered flexion and extension, but because of the, the concept, uh, the, the confusion that occurs, uh, we use the term dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. So the dorsal surface moving closer or the plantar surface moving closer. But again, this is still sagittal plane motion. The axis of rotation is this medial lateral, but we're looking at it from down here. If I put the pin in there, I'm getting dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. I can apply the same concept to all of the planes of the body. So here at the transverse plane, there's my vertical axis coming in. And at the axial skeleton, I'm getting rotation either left or right. And if I'm looking at the appendicular skeleton, I'm getting medial or lateral or internal external rotation of the appendages. And the same thing, it's this rotation with this axis coming in, and it's that bone or the pivoting that's moving, right? Whether I'm looking at the frontal plane, again, there's my pin, ab and abduction for uh, appendicular, or lateral flexion for uh, trunk and spine. So the, the one thing that to keep in mind is that this coordinate system is relative to the individual and it's not absolute, meaning that it changes with the individual. So we always reference from that standing upright, vertical, horizontal, you know, vertical and gravity. And if I lay down on my back or on my stomach or on my side, the coordinate system comes with me. So even as an observer looking down, even though this transverse plane for this person laying on their back is technically in their frontal plane for the person looking, this is still the transverse plane. Even though their frontal plane became their transverse plane, it's still a separate coordinate system. So this is not a universal thing we look at. We, it's universal in terms of the reference position, but as you lay down or as you change position or as you rotate or you move segments, the whole planar coordinate system comes along with you in that aspect. So for example, if I'm bench pressing and I'm moving my weight, uh, moving this weight, this coordinate system actually moves with me because I've, I've laid down. And so the transverse plane goes where the frontal plane was at. Sagittal plane stays sagittal plane and frontal plane becomes transverse plane. So that weight's moving uh, up and down. In the next video, we talk about the how the we look at the dominant plane, the exercise is moving in, but the joints where we actually do the joint analysis, flexion, extension, ab and abduction, that coordinate system moves based on the body position. So you always reference back to this anatomical position, upright, palms forward, um, standing, looking straight ahead. So you can see that as the person lays supine on their back, that transverse plane is consistent with this. So I would say that this exercise is moving, particularly if they have a wide grip, in that transverse plane. Now, if a spotter comes and is providing a spot, this is kind of a lighter weight, but if let's say it's doing a person's max, this person transverse plane would be matched up with the spotter's frontal plane. Right? So the planes are the same, but would still technically be, because this is the person doing the lift, this is the movement we're analyzing, 
this would be still the transverse plane, not the frontal plane. And you can kind of see here that the frontal plane of the spotter is the transverse plane of the of the weightlifter. So that's the big takeaway is that the, the plane is relative to the individual and it moves based on the position you're starting in. So whether it's the full body that's moving or whether you're externally rotating a shoulder or a limb or movement, the coordinate system has these very spe specific uh, axes of rotation. So you might make sure you want to make sure you know those axes, the planes of motion, which is occurring in, and that the coordinate system moves with the individual.